So this part of the talk, again, I'm gonna be talking more about some of the recent work I've been doing with, with people, or in particular in collaboration with some other people, um, again, sort of focused on the, the scheduling and, and filters. Um, so to, to close off some of the work on scheduling, uh, this is work that was in ITCS at the beginning of the year um, with, with Ziv and Isaac. Um, and so, you know, the results I had, up, you know, that I was showing you up to this point were really in sort of the queuing theoretic flavor, right, of like, well, you know, let's make some collection of probabilistic assumptions and you know, try and derive actual like formulas and things, right? And, you know, the, from the CS side, um, you know, people would ask me again, things like, well, can you say something a bit more like competitive ratio-y, you know, something where, you know, it's not just, you know, formulas for, for cases, but you actually get out something which, which sort of says, yeah, this is at, at most this bad. Um, and again, it, it took me uh, finding, finding this great set of collaborators to, to make that happen. And so the model here is that, um, you know, our, our model of noise is going to be what we call beta alpha bounded noise, E for below and alpha for above. So these are multiplicative factors. So if your true size is Z, um, your estimate will be between Z over alpha and, and uh, Z over beta. Um, or sorry, your, if your true size is S, your estimated size between beta S and alpha S, another way of saying that. And so we want a policy that has good expected time, expected waiting time or time in the system, essentially the same thing for, for any joint distribution um, that follows that, it, that it's you know, beta alpha bounded um, and would work for any values of alpha and B. Okay. So we're not like a full adversarial model where the adversary gets to pick the size, um, but they get to like pick sort of the underlying distribution of, of what the noise is subject to it being bounded in that way. Okay. Um, so what could we, we hope to achieve? All right, so shortest remaining, if we had all the knowledge, right, shortest remaining processing time is optimal. So what we'd like is for things to be, you know, consistent, where consistent here means like as alpha and beta go to one, that is as your model closes in on the, the correct size, then this ratio is, you know, bounded by some constant. Um, what we were calling graceful, right, or skipping ahead, what you might want is for things to be robust, which is that we'd like a strategy that's always within some factor of shortest remaining processing time for all alpha and beta. And, and we actually show that that's impossible in, in this sort of setting, right? So the next thing we might want is for it to be, oh. Okay, that's not me. Uh, uh, and, the, and the next thing we'd like it to be graceful, right? Where graceful just means that um, you know, as alpha, the ratio between alpha and beta get bigger, that is that we get bit bigger. If there's no ways, it was probably me hitting the mic. I'm sorry. No, okay. Um, you know, as alpha and beta, you know, the spread gets bigger in our air that, you know, we're within some constant times that, that alpha over beta. And what we're able to show is that, yes, we have a policy P that in fact, you know, this C equals one that as the error gets small, it actually converges to, to shortest remaining processing time, um, but is also graceful. That is, it's within a constant times alpha over beta, um, always, regardless of alpha and beta. And I'll just sort of give some of uh, the framework or idea. I'm not gonna try and prove the result because um, that's what the, the smart collaborators were for. Um, but uh, you know, this is all based on something that yeah, a, a way of thinking about how you do priorities is by, by rank. So the, we're looking at strategies where it's scheduling by rank, right? The lower your rank is the better. So the lowest rank job is going to get service at any given time. And so for shortest remaining processing time, your rank is your initial size minus how much service you've gotten, right? That's your, your rank, right? Um, that's how much remaining time you have left, right? Hi. 
And so if you were using estimates, right, this is the problem I talked about before, is that if your estimate was too low, right, you know, your rank, you know, ostensibly, I guess, becomes negative, right? And, and you're, you're sort of hogging the system potentially, right? So if you're a big job, you spend a lot of time down there blocking everyone, that's not good, okay? All right, so what's the right thing to do, right? So the thing we started thinking about, um, you know, is, okay, you, you bounce back up, right? Your rank, once it hits zero, you start going back up again the, the same way, okay? So your rank now is the absolute value of, you know, the prediction minus the amount of service time. Now, it turns out that there's a problem with that too, right? Which is once your rank goes just above your original rank, there's some sort of risk that something else that's new that sort of has the same rank as you started with could come in and preempt you, even though you are almost about to finish, right? So the point is, it's like you think, okay, like, you know, or my estimate was low and I'm bouncing around here. Um, and now my, my estimate is, or my rank is gonna be higher than my original estimate. Well, then I might get stuck behind a bunch of things that had that sort of looked like me that had the same estimate coming in, even though I'm actually just about to finish. And that can happen repeatedly. And for everything that came in and looked like me, the same, the same thing would happen. So it turns out the right thing is, um, you know, sort of the modified check mark, which looks like a square root sign. Um, we didn't call it the radical in the paper, we should have. We didn't think about that till uh, we started the talk, but that's a good name for it, right? So the, it turns out this is the rank function we're going to use. And then the rest of the paper is, you know, which I won't get into is, is proving all these things that this rank function works. Um, but one of the things that we had to do, or the reason like I couldn't do this myself is that um, the result ended up using some, uh, new tools from queuing theory called SOAP and WINE. SOAP is meant to be a framework that lets you sort of handle, develop the right formula for any rank banks policy, right? And that's actually new work that was, was done by one of the co-authors, Siv. Um, and yeah, like that's, I, I just needed people uh, who actually knew all the right tools and, and then we were able to put this all together. Um, but what we came out is this new policy, you know, with provably bounded uh, expected time that was this one consistent, as good as you could hope for, converges to shortest remaining processing time, but, but remains constant graceful over any offline data. All right. Um, so the summary maybe of this part is that scheduling and load balancing are, are very natural places for these sort of learning augmented algorithms. I think both for theory and practice, this is clearly a place where, you know, people are scheduling all the time, could be very practical. There's a great deal of scheduling work with learning also by, uh, there are some recent papers by Azar, Leonardi, and uh, Tuatu. Their model is different. So they, they work in sort of the more standard CS model where jobs are released as opposed to like the queuing type model that, that we're looking at. Um, there, there's tons of different issues to explore. Um, for those who know like about my work with power of two choices, I've been looking at power of two choice cues and have some empirical results, but the theory seems, you know, still seems hard. Um, so still, I think plenty of interesting things to do. Um, so I'm gonna close off, like this is actually the closing of part one of my talk. We'll see how much we get into to part two. Um, so just to be clear, like this is not all new, like I maybe have given the impression that it's like, you know, this whole new field sprang out of, you know, nowhere. Um, you know, th there have been similar sorts of things in the, the past. So online algorithms with advice has been an area around for, for a long period of time, but their sort of setting or framework seems to be different. Like they were generally looking at like, what's the complexity of getting optimal advice, right? So like for caching, you know, you just need one bit per item, right? If someone gave you perfect hints, it would be like, well, should I keep this in the cache or not? Well, here's a bit that tells you that, right? For scheduling, you could imagine a hints of the form, tell me where I should put this job in the queue. So they're looking at things like the complexity, 
Whereas I think the algorithms with prediction framework is more focused on sort of practical settings of we have these noisy predictions, we don't necessarily understand them. Um, what can we do with them? Again, there's been lots of work, as I mentioned in the beginning, on beyond worst case analysis um, you know, that's been around a long time. Um, uh, uh, the book coming shortly, I showed you, is, is actually out. Um, uh, um, you know, and to me, learning augmented algorithms is to me is sort of like, this is you know, the best way to think about beyond worst case analysis that I feel like I've seen, right? That, it, that I think it's going to be stronger, more robust and more practical than, than most of the other variations. Um, again, so tons of questions, you know, what problems are amenable to advice? What can be predicted efficiently and does it match what we want algorithmically? And, and one of the things is like, how can we interact or, or work with or give feedback to the machine learning community, right? Like, hey, this is what you should actually be optimizing for when you set up your optimization, because that's what's gonna help us algorithmically. Or, you know, uh, I think a, a good general machine learning question is, you know, how quickly can we figure out when our predictions are going wrong for whatever reason? And uh, um, so, you know, I always, again, this is the end of my first part of the talk, always like 10, you know, it's like, if you want to learn more, I'd say, if you want to learn more, you should go get this book, but that's not true. This book doesn't talk about this stuff at all. You should just go get my book because it's a good book. Okay. Um, so let me move on to, to part two. Um, I'm gonna be talking about two works. There's actually a couple other authors on, on some of the pieces of the work. Um, but this is work, like I said, so Tim McCroska, uh, you know, sort of was the one of the, was one of these authors on this initial paper of the case for index structures. And like, you know, I sort of had a back and forth, you know, the pleasant word would be discussion and the less pleasant word might be fight with them about like what was in their paper and, and so on. And like, uh, you know, and, but they were very nice. They, they, you know, they put up with me and taught me, you know, what they were doing. And I explained my, like I said, I explained my issues and it turned out to be really great. And in fact, so great that um, Tim and, and one of his students have been working with, with me and one of my students. And again, on some of these works, some, some other people on, on, you know, better and better versions of these learn filters. Okay. So uh, I will try and, skip through these things as, as sort of quick as I can. Um, you know, so uh, again, we've talked about set membership. Um, so here I'm gonna try and talk as quickly as I can about two works. So one of them is gonna be on point queries, which is like the Bloom filters we were talking about before, just is it in the set or not in the set. Um, but we're also gonna be talking about range queries. So here like your sets are integers, of some form and your queries might be, is there anything in this range, right? Which is a, a different sort of question. Um, right, and so as we've talked about filters or things that answer these things approximately, you know, we don't want false negatives, but we may accept false positives. Do, 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 do. Okay. Um, Right, so I've already talked about this malicious URL sort of application that we've been talking about, or I've been using an example in the first part, right? We might have a set of malicious URLs. You know, we ask, is this in the list? You know, if it's in the list, then we definitely don't want to look at it. You know, it, it might be bad if something like google.com was, you know, put in our list of malicious URLs, but, you know, for big, you know, ideally we'd figure that out and do a workaround but we certainly don't want any bad, um, bad URL to, to, you know, somehow be thought of as okay. All right. Um, all right, so as you might expect for both of these questions for Bloom filter type structures and range filter, you know, point filters and range filters, there are known lower bounds, right? Um, roughly speaking, things that are proportional to the size of the set, and they have a term that relates to the, the false positive rate, log of one over the false positive rate. And then for the range filters, there's an extra term that depends on like the, the size of the range of your queries for the worst case, okay? 
Um, but, but these are, again, these are worst case bounds. These are sort of assuming that these filters could hold any old set, right? And in the real world, often the sets you're looking at have some sort of structure, ideally some sort of structure that's learnable. And so our underlying question is, is can we do better, okay? And so for both of these things, we get better results, right? Um, you know, under certain assumptions. So we sort of get rid of the log R term under certain assumptions for the range filter and we, you know, lower it by, by some constant um, in that log one over FBR term. Um, and I'll try and explain where that comes from. Okay, so the first is I'm gonna talk about extending the learn bloom filter, okay? Um, so we've talked about, you know, the learn bloom filter design before Okay, using a backup bloom filter. Okay, and the question was, was this the best we can do using learning? And I tried to suggest at the end that, you know, we could do better because really in the model I was looking at, we were just saying like, okay, threshold this, right? You're getting some response. You can think of it as a score or probability. And we're just saying threshold this to get a yes or a no. Do I think you're in the set or do I think you're not in the set, right? Um, but really, even from the initial setup that they had, they had done, they were getting like some sort of continuous output. They were getting a score, right? So can we use these scores better? Like what should the design be taking advantage of the scores? And so we call this the, the partition learn bloom filter, okay? So the idea is that based on how confident the model is, that is based on the score, we'll have instead of like a single bloom filter where we send everything, we'll sort of split up the bloom filters or some number of bloom filters based on their score, right? So if it's a high score, so we think it's mostly malicious, we'll, you know, you know, we'll, we'll have sort of different thresholds where we'll send it to backup bloom filter one or backup bloom filter two or, or backup bloom filter three, right? Right, so the idea is that you know, if most of the malicious URLs, remember malicious here means ones that are, are in the set, you know, go to one bloom filter, right? We can size it appropriately, you know, knowing what the ratio of malicious and, and non-malicious things are, right? So, you know, we can say, okay, well, if we have these different bloom filters, we can figure out the space. If we assign different false positive probabilities to these bloom filters, and of course, you know, we can figure out their overall false positive rate. Okay. Assuming we, again, we know something about the distribution of where the, the benign URLs go. Okay. Right, so we have formulas, you know, fairly simple formulas, depending on, uh, you know, how we split this up. Okay. So then the question is, okay, so now we have an optimization problem how should we be splitting these things up? Right, so or this is a different way of picture of the same sort of thing. We're just gonna have multiple thresholds sending to, to the different possible bloom filters. Okay. All right, so what we're going to do is again, use a sample workload to try and figure out how to optimize these parameters, right? So we have our, one way to think of what's going out, we can say, okay, we've got our learned model and we're gonna take a sample, which we assume is representative of the future data. And what we can get out of that sample is sort of a distribution of the scores for the benign URLs, the ones not in the set and the malicious URLs, the one in the set, okay? And like what this picture is supposed to represent is like, well, this is what we, you know, if we have a good learning algorithm, Right, this is sort of what we expect this picture to look like, right? That the things in our set are gonna be like heavily weighted towards very high scores. And the things that are not in our set are gonna be very heavily weighted towards various low scores, right? But, but they're gonna be under some sort of distribution. Okay. All right, and so the question is like, you know, again, there's sort of two questions we have to deal with, right? One is where should we split things, right? And then how many bits do we provide each of these sub bloom filters, right? We've got a bit budget. How should we divide it up? 
um, to best make use of things, okay? All right, so um, we can set up this question of, you know, minimizing the total size of the backup boom filter. You know, there are different ways you could set up the optimization problem. We set it up like this, you know, minimize the total size of the backup filters while achieving some target false positive rate, okay? So we want to find the partitions, right? And find the sizes that, that map things together, satisfying the constraints, the overall false positive rates is less than or equal to, to F, okay? All right, so it turns out we can set this up as sort of a, a two-step problem of you know, finding both the optimal thresholds and then finding the, the sizes. Okay. Um, so it turns out we can set this up as, you know, we, we sort of discretize things and then we can use a, a dynamic programming algorithm to find the optimal thresholds. And then given the thresholds, you know, we can actually figure out the right bit assignment. Okay. So we have to do this sort of two-step process. And, um, this is a case again where I, I won't get too much into the math, but I'll say that, sorry, what comes out of this is that, you know, you can show um, that the, that should be an equal, not greater than, I thought I fixed that. The probabilistic bloom filter space, right, is going to be S times log of one over FP minus R. Um, and, you know, in this idealized world where you have these distributions, um, it's going to reduce that log one over FP minus R term by the KL there stands for KL divergence. So it turns out to be the KL divergence of the two distributions. If you haven't seen KL divergence before, don't worry about it. If you have seen it before, it's like some information theoretic quantity. And sort of the fact that like when we did this optimization, this term sort of magically popped out like the KL divergence. And it's like, oh, we know what that is, right? And it's like an information theoretic quantity. So that must really be the right answer. Like gave us confidence that, that we were doing sort of the right thing. Um, the other fun thing about that is like people are asking a question about, well, you know, how should we interact with or how do we deal with the machine learning people? So this is a case where we could sort of say, oh, wait, you know, whatever you come out with our learning algorithm, right, is going to, this is going to be sort of how we're using it. This is going to give us, you know, this sort of size reduction for our, our learn boom filter. It would be really great if in your learning algorithm, you could try and, you know, you know maximize the KL divergence between these distributions, right? So that's sort of like feedback we could give to the, the machine learning people. We could think of this as the loss function for our model. Okay. Again, I apologize for skipping a bunch of the math. I, I figure at this point, because this is again pretty recent stuff. This is um, this is uh, from last year, I think, or a year and a half ago, I think, uh, in NeurIPS, maybe if I'm remembering right. Um, uh, you'll go look at it if it's something you're you're interested in. Let me just briefly say something about the the empirical results. Right, so um, again, this is the same sort of curves we had seen before. We have false positive probability on the left and the space used in the right. So we wanna be you know, down in the leftmost corner as much as possible. Um, you know, again, notice the log scale on the false positives, the long scale on the space. You know, this, the standard bloom filter has this you know, straight line, right? You know, as you increase the space. Um, again, I, as we, I think I said before, the, the false positive rate falls geometrically. So you get the straight line in the, the log space. Um, and then these other curves were, you know, um, the first one, the sandwiching approach. You should think of that as just like a normal learn bloom filter. I didn't talk about it, but when I, when I did the learn bloom filter analysis, I came up with a small improvement, um, which was called sandwiching. You can think of it as like a step to, to this more general multi-thresholded um, learning bloom filter. And it's like, oh yeah, that, that does better, right? Um, and then there was someone who was trying to do something like what we were doing, but didn't have it set up as an optimization problem. They were using sort of more ad hoc improvements. 
and that's the eta BF, and sure enough, like it did, it did better. Okay. Um, uh, but then you get like, uh, you know, we were able to do the optimization, and that's when you get R curve, which is like significantly better. Okay. So I should point out this was an example on the URL data set, and you can see we put up on the right like the distributions of you know the scores for the malicious URLs and the non-malicious URLs. And sure enough, like for this example, they were, you know, as much as we could have wanted, right? This is what we had said we were aiming for, where it's like, yeah, the things in our set, all the scores are high, the things not in our set, all the scores are low. And that's part of why we get this big gain, right? And if you look at the paper, we have other data sets, you know, and it, it sort of follows the natural thing. The less the data sets themselves or the less your learning has this property, like, the more the scores or sort of distributions look closer together, the less gains you get from using this technique, right? So we really are taking advantage of the fact that, yep, the, the, the learning function here really is dividing up the scores quite strongly. Yeah, question. Uh, so, Andre, so the uh, x-axis on those graphs is the score you are predicting, right? The X, or the, the, the X axis is spaced use. Oh, no, and the, the malicious in design. Oh, sorry, the malicious in design, right? The, yeah, the, the, the X axis is the scores. No. And the, the Y axis is like the number of samples with those scores. So the minimums are like somewhat in the middle. So I'm, I was wondering why are like many malicious URLs being so, so you can think of that as that makes sense. Like if you have a good learning function, it should assign a high score or a low score. Like a middle score is a failure for your learning algorithm. It's roughly a, I don't really know what's going on here, right? Like you want, if it's in the set that it gives a high score, you want, if it's not in the set that it gives a low score. If it gives you like a 0.5, remember that's like a probability or a belief that it's in the set or not. That's your learning algorithm tell you. I don't know what's going on, right? So that that's bad, or so you'd hope for those ideally to be low. If if you're that's it, I mean, really, what those charts are saying is that yeah, URLs turn out to be you know, bad. URLs turn out to be pretty learnable, and if there are things that are less learnable, you know, this sort of technique will, will work less well. Sure. Okay, so um, just to summarize this part, the partition learn bloom filter just took your learn bloom filter and made it better by using, you know, not just one, but many, many backup bloom filters. Actually, I say many, many, typically we find that, you know, four or five, you know, gets you pretty much as much as you're ever gonna get, right? So it's, it's not actually that complicated. Um, and in this case, you know, doing the algorithmic analysis sort of helped us hone in on what the, the loss function is or, or what, the, what the actual problem is that, that might be helpful to the machine learning people. Okay. So now I'll talk a bit about range filters. So these are meant to deal with range queries. So, you know, you've got a set, now you're asking queries, you know, is there a key in the range 12 to 15, you know, in the, in the set? And then, you know, your, your query structure says yes or no, and, and maybe we'd take false positives, but we don't want false negatives. Like I said, there's, you know, a bound, um, uh, or there is a worst case lower bound that depends both on the false positive rate and the range of the size of your queries. Um, and, you know, what we're going to show here is that, you know, if we have, again, good, if we're able to, to say some things about the data distribution, we, we can actually do a lot better. Okay. So here, our, our model for the set is going to be the cumulative distribution function. Okay, so the, the question is, how are we going to use that? Um, so the structure we came up with is we call SNARF, the sparse numerical array-based range filter. Okay. All right, so, so what's the idea? Is that we're gonna take our set 
And we're gonna use the CDF to map it down into a much smaller domain in a monotonic way. And instead of storing the set values, store the map values. And the map values, this is gonna help us save space. You know, using the CDF ensures that this overall structure is going to be be preserved. And the monotonicity is going to make sure that the range queries make sense. So um, let me try and give an example. Okay. All right, so suppose that our original domain was like zero to 999, you know, we have a set. Well, we could just represent the set, right? We'd use log two of a thousand bits for each of the numbers. We have three numbers, we'd represent the set. You know, we can answer the queries exactly, right? Just by, you know, is there a key in this set? Well, let's look at the set, pick the numbers. It's all, all fine. Um, yeah, we'd be doing great. So one thing we could do is say, you know, I'd like to save some space. So I'm going to, you know, uh, map these numbers into a smaller domain. Right. And I'll do that by, you know, in this example, not necessarily how we do things generally, but in this example, we'll just like divide everything by 10. Right. So now our domain is zero to 99. So now when we talk about the space use, you know, we've saved instead of log a thousand bits per item, we use log a hundred. We can similarly map the query down and say, is there a key of 55 to 60? No, we get the right answer. It's all great. Yeah, we've saved space. Uh, still get the right answer. So we say, okay, let's do that again, right? Uh, map things down to 257. Now we use only log of 10 per item. So we're still saving space. But now when we map down the query, you know, we might run into problems, right? We might have rounded down to the, to the or not really rounded, but uh, truncated things enough that now we're gonna get a wrong answer, right? By losing precision. So, so that's the idea. The question is how, you know, how do we do this in a, in a useful or systematic way? All right, so what we're gonna do is keep some sort of representation of the CDF of the data, okay? Um, I think I say later, we're gonna actually use like, you know, uh, break up the data into you know, small sub areas and model each sub area as just a, a, a line segment. So linear along, along that area, okay? But we're gonna have some CDF, right? And we're going to map things down by essentially, you know, like, uh, you know, multiplying the, the value by, or multiplying our new universe size by the CDF value to get this, this new range. So it's not just dividing by 10, it's a bit more complicated. It's based on our representation of the CDF, but it's the same sort of idea, map things down to a smaller size. And so we get a compressed set. And the compressed set, we're gonna end up essentially just keeping a, as a bit array, okay? So the point is, you know, after we've got this function, right after we've applied this, this mapping, we can think of it as we have a new set of values from that, okay? And, and we're gonna store in some sort of compressed map um, those values, okay? So what SNARF is or what the space is as a data structure is whatever space it takes to keep this sort of monotonic CDF and then whatever it takes for the compressed set. All right, so how do we ask a query, right? So now when we ask a query, again, we just take the query endpoints and map them under the same mapping. And we're just asking the same sort of question. We're doing a range query on the smaller set, okay. right? So, you know, what does this correspond to? Um, again, you need some method or some sort of structure which just says, well, is there any key in this sort of smaller range? So you want to find you know, the smallest key bigger than some item. Um, there are different ways of doing that. You know, we discuss them in the paper. Um, you know, mostly I want you to think about how, how this sort of works. 
Um, because we say we're using a monotonic representation of the CDF, we can guarantee that false negatives don't occur, right? So if you're asking a query A, B, and there is a key X in there, because of monotonicity, F of X is going to be between F of A and F of B. And so, you know, your query is, is always going to respond yes when there is a key in there. So um, maybe the question is, well, how can you get false positives then, right? Well, you can get false positives, you know, if because I'm doing this sort of collapsing into a smaller space, you know, maybe X maps to the same spot as the endpoint A, or maybe it maps, you know, to the same spot as the endpoint Y, right? The only way you get these sorts of problems, the way you get a false positive is you have some value that maps, you know, to, to an endpoint of your interval. All right, so what can we say uh, about this? Again, it, it turns out, um, you know, so we, we can't handle all cases. They're sort of a worst case bound, right? But we can say that if the range queries are themselves independent of the keys and the range queries are, you know, reasonably sized, then it actually turns out that we get something that's, that's just log of one over the false positive rate. And to be clear, you know, uh, there's more in the paper about, you know, we can generalize this assumption somewhat about generated independently, you know, but essentially you can tell by our construction, you need something like that, right? Because we said, well, what are the problem cases? The problem cases are when you have a query and you have some point that's sort of just outside that query range and they map to the same place, right? So if your queries can depend on your data, you know, this isn't going to work. You're, you're going to be hosed. So if it, you, know, you, you would not want to use this data structure in a situation where people were asking queries, it's like, huh, you know, I think something like close to 100 is in your data set, but I'm asking like 95 to 98, right? If people were asking queries that were, you knew were close to the data points, this would not work well, right? But you need something like that to get around this lower bound. Okay. Um, so again, we did some experiments here. Um, you know, we looked at uh, 100 million uniformly random generated integers for our set. You know, we asked queries that, that are also random. And, you know, we do some comparisons. Um, Rosetta is one of like the state and the, the art type things. Um, but Rosetta ends up also sort of, again, uh, because of, you can think of because of that worst case lower bound, as the range size gets big, you know, um, Rosetta just, you know, starts to do badly. Um, Snarf, as you can sort of see here, it's sort of like, we don't care what your range size is, as long as it's not like super huge, right? We're going to perform essentially the same, at least again on these random queries. Um, and roughly what we can show is that um, there's some amount of overhead for our keeping of the model, right? So um, we actually use about this log of one over FPR and then the plus about two bits per key. The, the extra two bits per key come from keeping this monotonic CDF model function. Um, so one way to think about this, maybe like a high level picture, which I'll try, try and you know, state, which is like connecting the, the SNARF and PLBF ideas. Like, so, so again, SNARF takes advantage of the data distribution and compression schemes, has, has a better trade-off. Um, you know, one way to think about this uh, in sort of a recent direction is like, you know, and this gets into what people are asking, like, well, what do we expect from a learned model or, or you know, what should we be asking for in a learned model? Um, so, you know, it, it turned out, you know, like in the beginning, we might think of a learned model just giving a binary answer, right? Like, are you above a threshold or below a threshold? A yes or a no. Um, you know, you might also have a, and then we sort of said, well, a learned model can also give a score, right? Like you can think of it as giving a, a number that you can interpret as a probability or a belief, right? Which is a useful way of thinking, right? Um, but you could also have like a learned model that just sort of gives you like, Hey, I think this is the distribution of what, you know, of what some value is supposed to be, right? And so the question is, you know, 
how do we design algorithms in each of these settings, right? Um, and certainly I think sort of the more complicated you imagine the output of the learned model, um, maybe, maybe the better your algorithm can be, but also clearly the more complicated your algorithm is going to be and, and, and what it might need, right? Um, and then in particular, like for each of these setting, settings, what does that mean? Like, can we figure out some sort of loss function that we, that we can say, this is what the algorithm, you know, wants you to be optimizing, right? And feed that back to the learning team people and say, hey, look, this is, this is you know, whatever you're optimizing before, like tweak it so it's optimizing this. And then hopefully that will, will further improve the performance. So that to me is sort of like one of the, I wanted to end up with like, where are we or, or what are some high level questions to think about? And, you know, I, I think there's clearly a lot more we can do both in terms of lots of different problems that people haven't looked at yet. You know, you can uh, think in terms of, um, you know, I, I might joke or say something negative, take your favorite problem, then write the paper about, you know, how to do it with a, with a machine learning prediction algorithm. But I, uh, just to be clear, I don't, I don't mean that at all sarcastically. If you've been listening to the talk, that, that, that's what I did, right? Like, you know, I took problems that I was happy with and familiar with, filters and, and scheduling, was like, huh, I wonder what I could do now if, if I think of it this different way. Um, and, and I found it very useful and, and positive. So, so I don't mean that at all in a negative way. I think that's a great thing people should be doing find the problems where you already have expertise and think, huh, what could I do better if I, if I think this way now? Um, uh, yeah, so the, in the future, I think there's still tons of problems to, to be looked at, but I think also one of the things to think about is like, you know, to build this connection to the machine learning community even more strongly, like I, to be clear, papers in this area are now appearing regularly in ICML, NeurIPS, um, you know, whatever the other ones are, um, um, you know, ICLR, um, uh, and, you know, I review for those conferences and I'll help make sure they get in when they should. So, <laughs> um, you know, like, I, 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 th uh, I, I say that just because, and I think Piotr you know, you can corner Piotr on this too. At, at least like my first paper too that I was writing in this area, like I, I sent it to the machine learning conferences and like got back reviews, which were like, this seems really interesting. We don't know what this is. We don't think it's machine learning. Try, <laughs> try somewhere else. <laughs> um, um, but now the machine learning people are sort of like, oh, okay, no, we think this is machine learning now too. This is okay, right? Um, so, so I think that's, something that's changed in the, even in the short period that the field has been around. Um, uh, um, so I think it behooves us. I think this could be a, a really good place for theory people and machine learning people to, to connect and, and help each other um, uh, and provide, I think, you know, some formalism to the ML side that, that they don't always have in terms of how these things get used algorithmically. And again, for us, provide a new sort of way of going beyond the worst case that seems to me to be extremely both powerful and practical, right? That it will have an effect on the real world. And then, you know, and, and then as this shows, like I, I, I'm not even clear that we have a good idea or picture of like, you know, what we want our learned models to produce and, and how we should best use them and what the trade-offs are between like, you know, to, to me, and, and I tried to explore this a bit in, you know, the, the scheduling with one bit type results, which is like, well, you know, maybe one bit's easier to predict and you can actually do better if you, all you care about is predicting one bit than trying to, you know, predict an entire distribution. Could that, could that lead you astray somehow? You know, um, so I think there are just tons of questions in this area left to explore. Um, and uh, you know, so my motivation to go around and talk about is that all of you might try writing a paper on it. So um, uh, good luck. Yeah. 
So, so the question is like, what kind of model do you use? And, and that, that depends, like so far, it depends on the, the problem, right? So um, I will say like for the queuing theory ones, you know, I was just making up a model in some cases that, that wasn't at all realistic, just, just so I could say like, well, like I can analyze this mathematically. So I'm gonna pretend this is, this is sort of what the model produces. Um, so in some cases is that's what I've done. So in other cases like here, um, you know, when we're talking about the, the probabilistic learn, or sorry, when we're talking about SNARF, you know, we were saying, okay, we have the data, we can look at the CDF. We, you know, we can't keep the full CDF because then we're just keeping the entire data set and that's not useful, right? Um, but instead, you know, we're going to come up with a, a piecewise linear model Right. Um, and actually, yeah, I think some of the feedback we got in the paper was, well, is that the right model? Could you do something else? And it's like, well, of course you could do something else, but this is small and easy and works really well. So, you know, um, but, but I think that's always a question. Yeah. Uh, do you know uh, what role this robustness in like these learned, learned models play? Like uh, for the URL example, uh, let's say, uh, the malicious URLs, they change the somehow. Yeah, I, I, this is definitely an area that needs, you know, an, an issue that that I think uh, is going to continue to play a role where I think there's been some work, but, but I think, you know, tends to be, again, limited to specific problems is like, well, data in the world changes, right? And so the answer you can always give is like, update your model every three days or something, right? But for a lot of problems, that's not the greatest answer, right? Because maybe updating the model is itself very expensive. Um, so yeah, I think we need better answers to that problem to deal with the question of robustness with dynamic data. Um, and I, I don't think like I have a magic solution to that at all. Yeah. Um, earlier in the talk, I don't know if I this slide, but there was a slide that's about G based tools to see consistent and are robust. Mm -hmm. But are robust and like X and X next to it, you have to do a check mark. Why are we robust about that? Because uh, we proved that you can't be robust in that setting, right? That, that robustness is like not achievable. So, um, so, right. So that was a problem where it's like you might like robustness, but sort of like, yeah, in the worst case, terrible, you know, if your predictions were totally off, right? You know, if, if your predictions don't match what you expect them to, then sorry, there's sort of like, there's actually nothing you can do, right? Um, yeah, which sort of makes some sense for scheduling, I think. Um, yeah. For the efficiency, like, so greater efficiency, uh, like, uh, measure the number of bits you use in terms of like meaning the cycle data impact mm -hmm. the, the, the model size. Is it possible to like um, like improve the first part of the like, it goes most less and the number of the data is the whole? But we know the cycle So I'm not, I, I guess I'm not sure I understood the question, which was about reducing the size of PLBF. Why don't we take that offline? I, I don't think you can. Right, I don't, I don't think you can. Yes, like I think, yeah. So you, essentially, you, you need a structure that's linear size. I mean, you know, to do reasonable things with a false positive rate. Yeah. Very good model which separates the URLs. Say again. Even if you have a model that separates the good URLs and the bad URLs, perfect. I, I guess I don't know about perfectly. I'd have to think about what that, that what that might mean for the KL divergence. Right. Uh, any other questions? All right. So if not, let's thank Michael again.